So now in the last section, woohoo! <laughs> so we have 7.2, which is now going to be estimating a population mean. So it's a little different than uh, it was in the previous section, which was estimating a population parameter, um, so or population proportion. This one is a population mean. So some of the variables are a little different, but the process is very, very, very similar. So, okay, so in this section we again discuss point estimate, confidence level, sample size determination. So we still got those same three elements in this section, but it, again, there's some twists to it. But now we consider the objective of estimating a population mean, mu, where the population standard deviation sigma may or may not be known. So it's going to be, you're going to be able to determine that from the given information though. So you'll be able to make that uh, distinction right off the bat. Okay, so what are our key concepts? We got our point estimate. We should know that the sample mean X bar is the best point estimate or the single value estimate of the population mean mu. So very similar to the previous section. So if you wanted to make a guess on the spot about what the population mean is, and you have some sample data in your hand, you're going to use that sample mean as your best guess. That's all they want. The confidence level or interval, we can use the sample mean to construct a confidence interval estimate of the true value of the population mean. We should know how to construct and interpret such confidence intervals. And then the sample size, we should know how to find the sample size necessary to estimate a population mean. Okay, so our point estimate, again, this is a very small piece of it, but it is important. If you have to make a guess, about the population mean, you're gonna, your best guess, your best point estimate is the sample mean. So again, we're not gonna get into an example or anything, it's just a, a, a statement of fact. If you have to make a guess, a single guess, about the population, you use your sample. That's it. Okay, again, however, since a single value might be flawed in representing the population, it is better to develop an estimate based on a range of values instead of just a single value. So confidence intervals will give more information about the quality of the estimate. Keep in mind, the more realistic scenario will involve instances when sigma is not known versus sigma being known. So again, if you don't know the population mean, chances are you don't know what the population standard deviation is. That's essentially what it's saying. So, <clears throat> so we have two cases we're going to be looking at. So the first case is when we don't know sigma but the the hidden piece that is going to be in here is that s is known so remember s is the sample standard deviation so even though we don't know what the population one will be we will know what s is so that's important so when this is the case, we got all of our notation, we got our population mean. So again, we don't know this, this is unknown. Sample mean, this will be known. Sample standard deviation, this will be known. So we're gonna know the, the sample information. We don't know the population stuff, which is generally gonna be the case. And is our sample of values. E is our margin of error. We're going to see a formula in a little bit. And now there's something. Here's the first twist. The first twist is instead of Z scores, using the two tables, we're going to be finding T scores. So T scores and S go together. These are linked. So anytime you know what S is, you have to find a T. That's going to be critical. So we're going to see how to use the T. Uh, there's a table, so we're gonna I'm gonna pull that out in just a second. So so that's the first thing. We don't know what this is. We do know what this is. So that forces us to want to find the t score. All right. Now let's look at some other requirements that we have. So we got the sample is a, is a simple random sample. That's traditionally the case. That one's really not going to be a big. Uh, check that we have to worry about but it is important and we should have that in in uh, in place the second one is the more important one so either or both of these conditions is satisfied the population is normally distributed so we've seen that before back in 6.4 with the central limit theorem or 
n is greater than 30. So remember, we have to have some guarantee of normalcy in our problem before we can apply these techniques. So it's the same thing here. The population is either normally distributed, so n can be any size we want, or n is just big enough. If n is big enough, then we can assume it is normally distributed. So <clears throat> our interval notation, you can see, is it's very similar. Before, remember it was p hat minus e, and then we had p in the middle, and p hat plus e. It's very, 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 very similar. But instead of having our sample stuff on the outside, we have our sample means on the outside. Instead of having our population proportion in the middle, we got our population mean in the middle. So it's really very, very similar. Now the formula for your error is this. So it involves our t-score, which we're going to see how to do in a second, our sample standard deviation, which we should know, and we should also know what n is. So this stuff is, is going to be given to you. So you'll be able to have that at your fingertips. T, though, is where it's a little bit trickier. So the t-score is the critical t-score separating an area of alpha over 2 in the right tail of the student t distribution, and df, which stands for degrees of freedom, is equal to n minus 1. How they determine that, I don't even know, but it's just the formula, and that's what the way we, ha we have to use it. Okay, so let's see what this whole t-score stuff is all about. Now, there's a table in your book, table A3. That's what you're going to have to refer to for to find your t-scores. So it says a sample of size n equals 25 is a simple random sample selected from a normally distributed population. Find the critical t-score corresponding to a 95% confidence interval. Now, remember what we did back with the z-scores. We said, okay, well, if we have a 95% confidence interval, the first thing we did was we said, okay, well, what is alpha equal to? S same as before. Alpha is equal to 0 0.05. Remember, they have to add up to 1 if this was a decimal. Then we did what next? We took that alpha and we divided it in half. And you remember why we divided it in half? Because we wanted to center it on the bell. So we wanted half the area over here and we wanted half the area over here. But we didn't really care about this one. All we cared about was this one. That was the one we wanted. And then we would go to the z-score table and look it up. Well, it's a little different here. Now, the turns out this is going to be the area in one, oops, in one tail, which we can kind of see from our picture, right? Alpha over two is the area in one tail, alpha over, over two is the area in the other tail. If we combine them together, then this is could be called the area in two tails. Now you're starting to say, well, why is this important? Well, you're going to see it on the in the table in a second. So those are the two variations we can choose from. It doesn't matter which one you use, but you have to know what you're what you're describing is the big thing. So 0 0.025 is the area in one tail, 0 0.5 is the area in two tails. Now the last piece is this degrees of freedom. So remember, n is 25. So if n is 25, then the degrees of freedom is one less. So that's 24. Okay, that is all the information we need to go to our table. So if we go to our table now, A3, I'll try to zoom in when we need it. So there's a couple of things that we see. Across the top, we got area in one tail, we got area in two tails. So the nice thing about this table is that no matter which one you find, you should always fall into one of these five Row, uh, columns here. So one of these five columns is always going to be your focus. So in this case, you can kind of see, well, remember, area in one tail was 0 0.025. Area in two tails was 0 0.05. Might be a little small. Let me zoom in. Pull it back down here. So again, right, right in here is where, and they're both in the same column, and that's good. That's what we want. 
So we know we have to look at this column for our t-score. Now we look at the degrees of freedom on the side, and we drop all the way down to 24. So if we cross-reference, we can see we get 2.064. Done. That's your t-score for this particular problem. So t, sub alpha over 2, is 2.064. That's your answer. Now, the second part of the question says, why can you find the critical value? Now, remember, n is small. n is less than 30, so that, that's strike one. But what else do we know? It's a simple random sample, which is the first requirement, from a normally distributed population. So that's that other condition. So as long as one of those two conditions is satisfied, we're good to go. So this is um, this is able to be done because the original population is normally distributed. So that's why we can do it. So now let's do it one more time with some different situations in place. We got suppose the sample size in A was 40 instead of 25. Find the critical value for a 90% confidence interval. Okay, so if we have a 90% confidence interval, now the one thing to be careful about, remember these ones were special when they were Z-scores. When they're T-scores, they're not. You can't just assume it's like, oh, it's just this critical value on the table and that's it. You have to do it the long way, unfortunately. So, Alpha in this case should be 0 0.10. Now, you can choose to stop there because remember these two, if you grow an extra step, they're in the same column. So you really don't have to do the extra work. You just have to realize this is the area in two tails. So that's the area in two tails. N is 40, which means the degrees of freedom is going to be 39. And so that's all we need. That's all the information we need to get our T-score. So, we want area in two tails to be 0.10. So, that's going to be this fourth column here. So, now we can go down to 39. So, 39 fourth column, 1.685. So, T sub alpha over 2 is 1.685. Done. So T scores are really not too bad, but obviously you got to be a little bit careful. Make sure you know which column you're in. That's the most important thing. Degrees of freedom is the easy part, but to make sure you're in the right column, otherwise it's gonna you're gonna throw off your answer. All right, we're gonna see it in action in the next video.